Oh, well, what made you go to the Marquee Club when you when you first went? The time you saw Tess, what made you go there? What was it about the place? <laughs> That marquee club. Well, it was the legendary place in those days. That's where everybody played who was anybody. And me and my mates used to go down there wherever we could, whenever we could, I beg your pardon. Um, and certain nights would be certain things. Mr. G was there, the manager, you know, saying this is so-and-so night or whatever. And Thursday night for a long time, I think, was the nice. We used to go and see the nice every week. Um, and Rory Gallagher also had a residency there. And we used to go and see Rory every week and just open mouthed, I think, at the way the guy played and the person he was and the way he interacted with his audience, the way he could just hold people by tapping his foot or clicking his fingers or whatever he did. You know, he was just a magician as far as we were concerned, as an entertainer. And funny, funnily enough, he probably wouldn't think of himself as an entertainer. He's, he's such a pure man, Rory, you know. Uh, he, he thought of himself as a musician, and he never made any compromises towards being building himself into a superstar. But we went there every, every week and saw Taste, and they were magnificent. It was incredible. Brilliant. You mentioned the relationship with the audience. Was there something, was that something you hadn't seen before? What, what, how would you analyse that? What was special about it? What did he done that others hadn't done, do you think? I think Rory's elemental, and people could sense that. There's no pretense whatsoever. There's no showmanship which hides what the real man is. And he just came on there and played, and he would talk, and, and you felt like you had a one-to-one a -one relationship with him. That's the way I see it. Um, and his playing was incredible. You know, he's one of the very few people of that time who could make his guitar do anything, it seemed. It just seemed to be magic. I remember looking at this battered Stratocaster and thinking, how does that come out of there? You know, how does he do that? And we, we were boys. We hung around and hid whenever, when the marquee was at turning out time. And then we kind of strolled over as if we ought to be there and said, oh, hello, Mr. Gallagher, can we... Can we chat to you or whatever? You know, I don't know what we said. But he was incredibly patient. He was packing up his own gear. That's the kind of man he was. He was packing up his guitar and his amp and everything. And he had the grace to speak to us. He didn't go, get out of here. What are you boys doing in here? He, uh, and I said, how do you get the sound? What is it? And he said, oh, it's very simple. I have this guitar and I have this little, I have this amp, AC30 amp, which is like nothing else. And I have this little treble booster, little Range Master treble booster. And, and that's where the sound comes from. So I went straight out and got the, the AC30 and the, and the treble booster and my own homemade guitar, thinking, I wonder if this is going to work. But basically it did. As soon as I plugged in, I went to a place called Take 5 in Warden Street, not far from the marquee, and found a battered old AC30, which was for sale for 50 quid, I think. Plugged a, a Range Master treble booster into it with my guitar, and it gave me what I wanted. It made the guitar speak. So it was Rory that gave me my sound and that's the sound I still have that's that's my voice so I have so much to to um to be thankful to Rory too for mm. so the, so <laughs> so you, those were those the main things you took from the experience of meeting him can you just be a bit more specific? when you what did you take from him that, that that went into your playing I took a lot more from Rory really because a lot of his technique was was snapping on and snapping off, and that fascinated me. It seemed to make the guitar much more flexible. So the way he did his riffs, like ding 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 ding, ding, ding the morning sun, and ding 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 ding, 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 ding what's going on? Ding 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 ding, 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 ding. That I incorporated into my playing. I learned that directly from him. So something like tie your mother down is really a direct lineage from from Rory. Tell you what else I learned from Rory. Don't be an ass. You know, so many people you go up to them and say, you know, can I talk to you? And they'll be, oh, I'm too busy, whatever. Rory was always a gentleman. He, w he always had time for his fans. And many, many times I bumped into him. He was, he was always the same. <clears throat> I think the last time I bumped into him was in some studio in Shepherd's Bush somewhere. And, he, and it was exactly the same. He said, oh, hello, Brian, you know, and, and how you going? And he had such a gentlemanly, gentle way about him, Rory. And I thought, well, He's treated me like that because we know each other now, but it went through my mind. He treated me exactly the same when I was a kid and he was a star in, in the marquee. He was always polite. He was always 
caring, always had time to speak to you. So uh, that's what I took from Rory. He's a gentleman and he had time for people. Um, and my God, could he play that guitar. Do you think he got the recognition he deserves? He sounds quite a self-effacing guy, from what you said. Do you think he, you know, should he have been pushier? I don't know. No, because he wouldn't have been Rory Gallagher if he'd been more pushy. No, he did it for the love. And I saw him all over the world. We used to bump into him. I remember seeing him, seeing him in Boston. And it was the time of, you know, Aerosmith and, and us. We were all, you know, the, the, the bands of the time. We were quite showy. You know, we, we were consciously putting on a show. Rory had a very pure, basic attitude. It was like, I go there and I play, and I play my songs, and I speak to the audience, and you give me a couple of lights, give me my amps, and that was enough. He wasn't into that kind of thing. He was not into showbiz. And that's part of him, and that's part of what you have to love and, and respect. Of course he didn't get the recognition he deserved. No way. Um, because I think he sidestepped the things which would have made him a Bruce Springsteen or, a, or an Aerosmith or whatever. You know, he just was always content to play and he liked the club environment, that's obvious. He probably wouldn't have enjoyed that much doing stadium shows because it would have taken his, his intimacy away. I don't know, you know I'm, I'm sort of guessing, but the guy had no... Rory didn't... well... The Rory Gallagher that I saw didn't have ambition outside being a fabulous musician, playing fabulous music. Did you ever play his guitar? That's a bit of a question. Yeah, that is a question. I can't. You know, I can't remember. Don't quote me because I can't remember. (laughs) It's a shame, isn't it? I'd love to be able to say yes. Now, this, this, you talked earlier, the other thing about sticking together is a good idea. Um, did you feel that between the members of Taste, there was something that held them together? What was it, do you think, that held them together? Well, Taste is a little bit different from Deep Purple, I would say, because Taste is so much focused on Rory. You know, it is his band, it is his songs, it's him who's doing the talking and him who's doing the, the playing and the singing. So, I don't know if we were... <clears throat> conscious of the interactions between the members of Taste. And I also don't know what happened when they split up. I wasn't a party to that. I don't know what feelings were like. But seeing Rory Gallagher with his subsequent bands, I didn't get a, a terrible sense of loss. Maybe that's a terrible thing to say. You know, I think Taste is still some of the, my favourite music that, that Rory made. But I enjoyed seeing him with his other bands as well, just as much probably, because I was. Always, I guess I didn't really take my eyes off Rory and <laughs> that's the way it was really. Did you ever get a chance to talk to Rory about the influence he'd had on you? Yeah, um, yeah I think whenever I bumped into Rory I was conscious that I wanted to let him know how much he'd given me. Yeah so I, I generally did make a point and he was always like oh Brian you know <laughs> it's very self-effacing was Rory, but yeah, I would make one, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad, I'm glad I took the opportunity. My God, he was taken from us so prematurely. It's awful. It's so sad. Um, yeah, what, what a great guy, and what a wonderful player. The last thing he's done is he's given me a list of some <coughs> songs from the set list, the Isle of Wight, which is what, the, what, what, what we're running. Mm. Um, so I was just going to, if I may, just quickly run through and see if they have a specific memories mm. for you. Mm. Uh, what's going on? Mm. It's uh, off the... Um, uh, on the boards album, what's going on? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I learnt it. You know, there's, there's not many guitars that I actually learn, but I did. It's it's a nice little exercise for anybody who's learning the guitar. Play uh, play that track. What's going on? Um, it has a nice way of pounding as well. You know, it's 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 a real out and out rocker, and he can he can sing sing the hell out of it. You know, as he does. Sugar Mama is another one that was mentioned. Yeah, I don't know it so well. And of course, Morning Sun, which you touched on. Morning Sun is great. And Morning Sun, of course, has that syncopation, which is fairly rare in sort of great rock hits. It's very, it's much more blues than rock. 
um, and much more blues than pop, of course. I think I think Rory never could have been called a pop star. <laughs> he never came close to being a pop star by choice. And um, yeah, that's one of my favourites. Always will be, and uh, we we still play it at sound checks, and you know, it, it, it'll always be inside me. At the studios, I'll remember. Yeah, I'll remember. That's nice. There's a lot of heart in that song. There's a sort of wistful side to Rory. Love that. I feel so good. Remember that? No. <laughs> Catfish Blues? Yeah, I know Catfish Blues. It's good, good Rory standard. Yeah, I think that's, that's another thing that anyone can play um, when they get together and jam. You know, if they don't want to play just ordinary 12 bar blues, play something by Rory because there's always a little twist there. And the last two, the same old story. Same old story's great. Yeah. Well, it would almost be uh, Rory's epitaph, couldn't it, really? You know, it's. Um, I didn't know Rory well enough to know what his private life was like. You know, I don't know what his love life was like, but I get the impression he was so dedicated to playing, it was probably, it probably had to be a, a, a very much a second thing for him, you know, a secondary activity. I feel like I know Rory probably better through Donald since he went, you know, because Donald's told me a few things about him as a, as a person, which are revealing, you know, and um, I think there is a lot of sadness in his songs, but Rory probably would always understate that because it was about performance and connection. He wouldn't wallow in something being sad. 